All right, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you guys for, uh, for joining us. I'm uh, hoping everybody can hear us. I don't think, I think this is a small enough room that we don't need the microphones or anything. So appreciate everybody for, uh, for coming out today. I am Sean Nowak, president of Nowak Dental Supplies. Um, I think we've got some valuable information that we can share today on our panel. So wanted to go through uh, our distinguished guests that we have up here, go through uh, their bios that we have. Uh, so I'm excited about what we, uh, what we have for you guys. So to my left, we have Jed Archibald, CDT. Jed started training to be a dental technician at Archibald Associates when he was 15. Archibald Associates was and is the private in-house laboratory for Dr. Gordon Christensen. And I think some of you guys have heard of him. It is, uh, it is also was a private dental laboratory school where at the age of 18, Jed formally started instructing at the school. Archibald Associates and Christensen Prosthodontics is also where CRA, now CR, started. Through that environment, Jed has had the opportunity to be part of many groundbreaking products we know today. Products such as Creation, 3D Master, Empress, SmileLine, Initial, Emacs, and many more of the processes that accompany them. In 2011, Jed formally opened Archibald Digital as the digital arm to Archibald Associates. With Jed's unique background in traditional dental technology, his mission has always been to hold digital processes and materials to the same standards that highly trained craftsmen have established. That higher standard has created breakthroughs in CAD CAM, centering, 3D printing, with more exciting developments to come. To the left of Jed, we have Stuart Steinbach. Stuart began his career at Whitmix in January 1999, pretty much the same time as I did. Stuart is a fourth generation Steinbach at Whitmix who was there for 19 years. Stuart led Whitmix in their trans transformation from analog to digital. Stewart founded the Whitmix Milling Center in 2007, added Whitmix as the original distributors for both Roland and Asiga. While there, he oversaw the formulation and commercialization of the Veracore line of materials. During his tenure, Whitmix received six JDT WOW awards. After leaving Whitmix, Stewart joined Carbon 3D where he was responsible for launching the L1 print system for high volume thermoforming. After nearly two years at Carbon, Stewart left for Origin Laboratories, where he was responsible for leading Origin's 3D printed swab program that resulted in over 200,000 printed swabs being printed and distributed. Following the acquisition of Origin for $100 million by Stratasys, Stuart, Stuart was a Origins product manager for the integration into Stratasys, where he was a key contributor to Stratasys' overall dental strategy. Last April, Stuart left to join ODL Dental Laboratory as their VP of Corporate Business Development. ODL is a full-service orthodontic lab based in Buffalo, New York that is a leader in the use of digital te technology. Stewart has had a long passion in, for our dental industry, serving for over five years on the Identaloy board and spending over 10 years on the NADL Vision 21 planning com committee and as a co-founder of the NADL Race for the Future, which has raised over 500,000 for the NADL Foundation. Lastly, we have Doug Statham, Senior Director of Sales and Direct Digital Market Materials at Keystone Industries. Doug Statham has worked in the dental industry for more than 24 years with a focus on digital dental technology. He began his career with Nobel BioCare as Procera Digital Specialist and has spent the last 20 years working with de design software, milling, and printing solutions and the materials needed to manufacture digital restorations for the dental industry. He specializes in working with dental laboratories, providing digital and material solutions that improve workflows and profitability in today's modern laboratories. Thank you guys for joining us. So I think really we want to start off with kind of getting a, a sense of, of where everybody in this room is in the 3D printing world. So just kind of a, a show of hands. First, who all has 3D printers in their labs already? And out of those that have raised their hands, 
uh, let's kind of go brand specific. Is it Einstein printers? Uh, Segas? Carbons? Um, what are the brands, gentlemen? Okay. 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 Form Labs? Okay. Okay. So that kind of gives us a, a little sense of, of where um, any, no printers, no printers at all. Okay. All right. So very good. All right. I think that helps. So look, we're, this is going to be a free flowing discussion for the, for the panel. So, um, you know, it's, it's, um, I think we've, we've all discussed this. We're, we're going to kind of let this conversation kind of build off of each other. We really have no set, set agenda here. It's just going to be, it's going to be fun. So, you know, ask questions if you guys want to throw anything our way at the end. So we're, we're more than welcome to answer anything towards the end of this. So, uh, gentlemen, so I'm going to throw the first question out. Any of you guys want to jump in on this one? So how do 3D printed materials differ from other materials used in dental laboratories? Uh, you know, right now, for the technology we have, because we're using mostly a resin bath, uh, right now we're kind of limited compared to some of the materials we're used to. You know, in milling, with milling anything you can mill, essentially you can mill anything you can slap together. So you could put hamburger meat next to metal and mill it, theoretically, right? But you can have these really dynamic multi-composition materials with milling. Uh, 3D printing right now, because we're using a resin bath, we are limited to kind of a single composition that needs to be light cured. Um, and so that's the main difference. So, we're, I mean, we're, the technology is advancing greatly, but to think that it's going to completely take over everything today, no, we, there's, there's some technology hiccups we need to come all overcome. And, uh, you know, we need to get more dynamic materials. And that's where, you know, that's where a lot of the scientists and real think tanks are working on right now. Two, having worked on both sides of the resin hardware, um, you have, you'll have a resin formulation that works with a given hardware set, right? So form, form labs are a lot of the early printers at 405 nanometer, right? That's the wavelength. It cures and you get, you know, some limited chemistry sets that you're able to work with. Um, and then as you, you know, we all went to sort of 385 about six, seven years ago, the majority of the industry did. And that opens up a whole nother set of chemistry that you're able to play with. Um, and then you get into um, what the hardware can do itself from a separation mechanism, you know, how fragile that part can be when it separates. Um, so you really are captive to the manufacturing process or the printing process with what your chemistry of materials are. And so we think, constantly seen that seesaw back and forth of materials that work pretty generically but without a lot of the properties that we're used to um, and then the hardware gets better the hardware gets better well that opens up formulation potential and so you sort of end up with this seesaw back and forth where today um, you know we can all look at the progression of a splint material or a denture resin and what the physical properties are on those today versus where they started five, five ten years ago it's light years ahead, but most of that's been enabled by improved hardware that unlocks different chemistries to give us better better properties. I think too that the technology, if you just go back five years ago, and he's spot on about the the idea of the the restorations that you're able to do now, you really can't blend different materials together. Although, hopefully, in the not too far future, I think a Sega has done a little bit of that of blending a soft splint and a hard splint together in their prints. So it's a, it's starting down that road. I think you'll see some more of that when it comes to uh, ceramic restorations that'll be printed probably five to 10 years from now, but blending materials right now with 3D printing is very difficult. The 3D printers though, if I just go back to five years ago, <clears throat> and I worked with Envision Tech back then, and um, you know they were one of really three or four printers that were in the market. Very, very unreliable and unpredictable, but if you look at pretty much all the printers that you guys are using in the room now, the reliability of those printers has in increased dramatically, and I think that uh, Carbon did a terrific job. Those, and uh, all those of you who use Carbon realize that they have created a really, really solid platform that can do repeatability in the prints that are going to come off. You don't have to go home at night and worry that it's not going to be done when you come back in the morning. So. Um, 3D printing is also, the, as far as the workflows are concerned, it's, it's not for everything, obviously. Um, Keystone is, we're, I've had meetings all morning about this, about expanding our product line, and we will. 
But again, it's difficult to, to combine those materials. And until we can do that, I think that the uh, Stratasys product that, we're, that they're gonna be launching um, here, I think you're gonna see a lot more development in that space in, in creating more aesthetic restorations. Like, I think the dentures is kind of the next forefront. If you, all of us want to print dentures, um, a lot more than we're doing now, but unfortunately the aesthetics of that product is, are still somewhat limited. So you're going to see more varieties of tooth color, you're going to see more varieties of, of the base colors and so on and so forth. So you're going to see some drastic improvements of that, um, not just from Keystone, but I think from all the manufacturers. The competition when we started, there was only two or three manufacturers. That's broadening all the time now. So so, and I think a couple of you, you touched on it in there. So is multi-material printing beside Stratasys, because their technology is a little different than some of the other printers, the DLPs, the SLAs. Um, that is a possibility in the future with some of the DLP printers and the SLA printers based off the materials. I, <laughs> I would say no. Um, I would say no, just because, well, if you're talking about a bath, um, you know, to have a true multi-material composition, you'd have to go from one bath to a separate bath with the technology we have now. So you can have a more complex material in one bath, but to kind of go from like, you know, a bath that has dentin and then all of a sudden the arm moves over and it's dipping into incisal, you know, and you get a gradient going that way, for instance, um, that's going to be tricky. I think, I think maybe the best we can hope for is better materials in the bath itself. And I know we've had conversations with quite a few manufacturers of, is there a way we can actually uh, change some of the properties of your prints just with your post-processing and curing, right? So essentially with a hand wand light, can you cause part of your material to be more translucent, just the part you want? Can you cause it to maybe be more flexible or more rigid? Uh, just in post-processing kind of characterization. And those are kind of the things we're kind of hoping for, right? But those are, those are the reaches and I think I think it's important to kind of understand the limitations of something so you can really understand the potential, right? You're not wasting time on areas that are just gonna be wasted time. Yeah, I mean, the challenge with DLP multi-material printing is you always have to index the part back. And so if you're kind of wrapping a part with a, one material with a second material, you can do that from a design perspective, but you have to have where the new material is going exposed. It all has to be indexed. And so your Z height accuracy has to be remarkably <laughs> accurate. And the leading edge of that second material has to be at the bottom of the part so that you can then build up or around it. So, I mean, I've seen, you know, where people have kind of tricked the system to be able to do like a hard, soft night guard. Um, but it's, it's a real challenge, yeah. both from a design and a manufacturability perspective. So I think for the foreseeable future, Polyjet is going to be the the one print technology that's resin based, um, where you know you can you're jetting five materials simultaneously, and if the design software is there, then right then we can add up mamelons and sizal effects, you know because it's a true CMKY. You can you can add anything you'd want to aesthetically, um, from incisal edges to capillaries and dentures. I, th I think the Polyjet is probably the closest to that next generation printer that's going to give you that flexibility with aesthetics. How soon that's going to become commonplace in your laboratories, whether that be the cost or whether it's the capabilities of the technology is still yet to be seen. But I think you're going to see more and more um, cosmetic kits that you can combine with your printed products to give it a more lively look or more realistic look. Um, we, we are in the development right now of a product that hopefully will, for dentures, because the dentures, again, if you look at the overall market right now, we'd all love to do more, but it's just not there yet. We haven't seen it. We were gonna launch something a year and a half ago. We decided not to because it just wasn't up to the standards as to what we'd like to see. I mean, for those of you who don't know, Keystone is actually a cosmetic company. We're the largest supplier of nail finishing products in the world. And so cosmetics is in, in appearances are very important to us. And, uh, we we ha we weren't getting there with the with the base material that we had, so we're going to be coming out with a cosmetic kit that will enhance that to make it a little bit more pleasing for the patient in the final outcome. So, and at at the risk of us sending everyone out to buy Stratuses, right? Um, you know, I will I will say that, you know the big the, the huge bonus and the reason why our industry has gravitated towards DLP and resin baths, 
really has to do with resolution and accuracy, right? Because we've been able to get everything from a 50 micron and some companies even lower than 50 micron, but we're functioning around that 50 micron accuracy, right? And that's what we really need in dentistry. Now the problem with you know SLS, which would be kind of your powder bases, right? Where you can come in and cure a powder of ceramic or whatever you want. Maybe some of you have seen that with like figurines where people scan people and then print a figurine that's full color and everything. Uh, or the stratuses, right? The real limitation to both of those, because we want that capability, but the limitation is those right now are functioning at an 80 micron resolution function, right? So the jets for the polyjet right now, we can't get them smaller than 80 microns or someone hasn't figured out how to, right? So that's kind of your limitation. So that kind of really limits us in our industry to really looking at kind of removable processes, more simple applications. Uh, but when you talk about restorative, we need to be at 50. And the sad truth is if your target's 50, you're gonna hit 75, right? So your target needs to be 25 so we can hit 50. Uh, so that's where DLP has been a huge added benefit. Um, and the thing that's been sad to see is a lot of DLP companies, they've been watching what clinicians are doing and clinicians are printing at 100 microns for speed. And so a lot of our companies, a lot of new printers you're gonna see on the floor today, they'll say things like, hey, we have a, you know, a 50 UM resolution deviation and that's just discrepancies in full build plate XY, right? but they aren't telling you that they've actually made the build plate bigger by moving the projector farther away. And now you have a 65 to 95 UM pixel, right? So there, even the companies are kind of getting steered, I think, in my mind, the wrong direction. Uh, Cause we need better resolution. We need better accuracy in our industry. You know, we need speed, but uh, we also need better, better resolution and accuracy. So with talking about polyjet and let's, let's shifted to the other direction and the lesser lesser expensive side look we all know that the operatory side drives our market so and and i'm not the one that coined this phrase right but in in social media world they're they're phrased as the gumball printers right so the lcd printers of the world they're 500 hundred dollar printers out there what do you feel that you see a lot of dentists buying these printers what do you feel as those are doing to the market and to the space when you see so many doctors buying these printers and printing in-house with those kind of printers. I mean, I'll, yeah, I'll take the bullet. I mean, I'll, I'll be the first one, but uh, you know, I, it's, it's terrifying. So, okay, it's, it's terrifying just because they're the closest to the patient and this is a new technology and it takes, uh, it takes a while, right? It takes a while to get your feet wet and figure it out and learn all the do's and don'ts. And they're doing this while in a clinical environment, which is like being a combat medic to begin with, right? It's like, here's a new piece of technology while you're working on some with their arm falling off. It's, and so we see all these things, like I saw in the last post from one of the 3D printing forms, um, you know, a, a doctor, he had just finished printing a ceramic crown and he said, hey guys, this seems pretty tough and pretty strong. Do I even need to post cure it? And, and it's no, you know, it's, it's not a knock against the doctor. It's just, that's how new it is. Right. And that's how little information there is being given to the clinicians. So, uh, I'm more terrified of the fact that they're just being bombarded with something so new, so close to the patient. Um, I have to agree with that. No, I, <laughs> um, we, we work with probably 50 different printers right now. Um, and everything from, let's say, a Lux Creo all the way up to the carbon um, products. And uh, the idea that a doctor is going to take this on it. Now, I'm not going to, it's the 80 20 rule as always, but there's certain doctors out there that'll take the time to understand it properly and to use it properly and know their own limitations. I mean, if they're going to try to do crown and bridge restorations in their office, um, the learning curve on that's going to be, it's just not worth it to them, quite frankly, at this point. And when they come out with some more software, in the in the printers on the lower end anyways become better printers then then maybe they'll have more success but i think we're you know if you if you think back to the days when the doctors brought in milling systems into their offices and it scared the hell out of all of us the reality is as many of those things became coat hangers okay they just threw their jackets on them as they came into work and they threw away quite frankly hundreds of thousands of dollars for them 
Um, some of them still continue to use them today and they're very successful with it, but it's a small percentage of them. So I think the same thing's gonna happen here. And I, I go back to 20 years ago when even with Procera, I had a couple prosthodontists that bought the Procera scanner and were doing some of this work themselves. They were successful at it, but there was more people that eventually, you know, it, it became obsolete in their office very quickly. And because it took so much time for them to learn, it really wasn't worthwhile, and the outcomes weren't what a prosthodontist would want, too. So I, I don't think that we're going to stop it from happening. Um, the price points, uh, again, I work with printers that cost $500, and I work with printers that cost $250,000. And I can tell you they, they do work differently. And the doctors that think they're going to get the same outcome as a laboratory on a $500 printer as a laboratory is doing on a you know, a carbon, it's just not going to happen. So they, they need to be realistic about their investment in this. And I don't think we're gonna, you're, you're gonna see some of the manufacturers out there, they're already doing it, that are going into Patterson and they're going into Henry Schein and they're saying, you know, let us sell these to your doctors. And I, in, in, unless there's that support, and I, and I tell people this all the time because they'll ask me which printer should I buy, it's number one, what is, what is it that you really want to print? If you want to do crown and bridge, you're making a mistake to start with. If you want to print night guards, it's, it's not that difficult to do it. You can outsource the design, send it back and print it in your office. Know that you have to actually post-cure it because that's probably the biggest failure point of printing. But know what your limitations are, know what your expectations are. Don't go into this and think you're going to replace your laboratory because it's not going to happen and they're going to learn the hard way unfortunately, because the market wants to drive that into the doctor's office. I think it's a disservice, number one, to the patients and the outcome of the cases, because I don't think they're going to get what they need. So and I think part of your question too, Sean, is if for a manufacturer standpoint, right, how do you, uh, how do you explain that to the customer, right? How do you help them navigate? Because you want to make them happy. You don't want to get yourself in hot water either. You don't want to have a bunch of, you know, contact calls coming back and service calls. So. The way I explain it to clinicians or anyone else essentially is a lot of your, your gumball printers, uh, your $500 printers, really the, the raw hardware that I'm seeing from them is, is really cool, really fantastic. So I have, I have four or five of them in there right now that are, all of them are either 28 microns all the way down to 22 micron pixels. And these are LCD screens. So just like your TVs when you go into Costco, they keep getting bigger and better and cheaper, right? And so that's what these are doing, but it's a raw printer, right? So I would say your Asigas, your Carbons, those are more like your true manufactured sedan, right? You got power everything, you got navigation, right? You got a whole service team. Whereas the gumballs, if you want to call them gumballs, that's like buying a kit car, right? That's what you buy when you want to go around a track really fast. You want to do one task really fast. You don't have windows, you don't have a roof, you don't have doors, right? If you want a seat belt, you got to put it in yourself, that type of thing. And so since I'm, I'm kind of on the engineering side, I have to actually engineer materials to work on those printers properly. I have to do that homework myself. I have to learn this kind of complicated software myself. I have to learn how to maintain these printers myself where companies have really taken millions and millions of dollars to try to make that easier for you. That's what these companies do and that's what they're successful at. So it's, it, it's not that the gumballs are bad, it's just look at them like a kit car, right? And you gotta do the work. Yeah, the only thing I get kind of adamant about in printing is if it goes in a patient's mouth, it needs to be a validated workflow from design through post-cure. Yeah. Because, yeah. you know, every, every resin we play with is a sensitizer. And if, you know, you only get a very limited green strength cure. So on DLP, you're typically around a 60% cure rate, maybe up to 80%. You don't even, you know, like a PMMA is at 100% with more or less the same chemistry. You don't get anywhere close to that until you get go through the cure box. And so trying to mix and match, and I think Keystone to me is, I've I worked with them from soft splint, pre-launch to carbon all the way through today. I mean, the validated workflows and, and the processes that are documented on the website are invaluable. So, you know, what you do with the model material, <laughs> A few other things, okay, but if it goes in a patient's mouth, it really should be on that. It should, it has to be that validated workflow, or we're putting the patient's health at risk. I I agree. So I need to yeah I need to clarify for those who don't know I'm crazy, okay I'm legitimately crazy. I didn't uh, say you were doing anything. No 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 <laughs> no but but I, I did leave the door open. So I mean a lot of what I do really is is purely restorative, and what I use the printers for almost 99% for is model work. 
right? I want to get out of the Stone Age. I want to get rid of models and I want to make that digital, right? So I'm looking at great software and I'm looking for great printers to give me type 4 dental stone. And I can't get anywhere close to type 4 dental stone at 50 microns. I have to be under, right? And so I, I work a lot with Dr. McLaren. We've been working on this process quite a bit when we're talking about purely models, right? Pure accuracy. And with some of these other printers that we have, like the 22UM, uh, we have great pictures and great studies where literally we can take printed dyes for really nasty no prep or minimal prep veneers. You can duplicate the printed dye, pour in refractory, do a feldspathic veneer, and actually get it to see. Okay, so you can't do that with anything that is even close to 50 microns or above. We have to have that crazy high resolution. But again, I have to do all that homework to make the resin work, to make the printer work, just to take advantage of that resolution. But yeah, if we're talking about anything that would be a class two type material that's going in a patient's mouth, ah, yeah, no, I'm not, I'm not gonna risk any of that. So that type of printer is not commercially available? Yeah, they are. Yeah, they are. Those are your frozens. Uh, the any cubics, which aren't quite as good, but I mean, your frozens, your mini 8K, your mighty 8K, your mega 8K, you know, that big monster, I have that one. It's yeah, it's crazy. It's like a, you know, it's like a TV tray, right? It's a massive thing, but it's 43 UM pixels. Really accurate all the way out. Um, I have to put good resin in it, though. You know, a lot of these companies, they're sold to hobbyists right now. It, you know, it's fantastic hardware, but it's being given to hobbyists, and they're using, you know, $30 a liter hobby resin, you know, which is completely inaccurate and un inconsistent and stuff. So it, you have this kind of you have kind of a weird view of what these printers can do, but if you actually put good materials in them and go through the headache of validating them and making sure they're really dialed in, uh, they can perform really well. They can perform really well. So on those biocompatible parts, what is the printer more important or is the curing procedure more important? The validated workflow. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it really, you can get, you can get great parts off a cheap printer, you can get great parts off an expensive printer. But, you know, when, when I send parts to Keystone for validation when I was at Stratasys, they're checking my accuracy, they're doing a cytotox test, and they're doing mechanical property testing. And each part of the print process plays a role in what those final outcomes are. And so that's, you know, if you want to go with an open source like Keystone, then I mean, they do it right by far better than anybody else in our industry has. People, the, the validation to me, in the, in, which is the curing is part of the validation. So what the cytotoxicity, obviously, that's they just take the stuff and put it in a Petri dish and put some fish eggs in there. And if it hatches, then they say, well, it's not going to be um, detrimental to the patient. But then we have to take that material and put it in each one of the printers. So if you have a carbon, or if you have an Asiga, or if you have a, a whatever DLP printer that you have, those settings are going to be different on each one of them. So we have to go through and make sure that we're optimizing the material to that particular printer. So and then every cure box. And then so no, I even even samples yeah. for every cure box. Even the cleaning part of yeah. it too has to be that whole workflow has to be done. So we have to yeah. use the right cleaning material. How are you cleaning it? How are you drying it? You know, using a compressor as opposed to just letting it sit on the windowsill. You'd be amazed How at some. How long you leave it in the solvent? <laughs> exactly. So then the post curing in. And now, if I was to say the one call I get, and, and how many of you use the, the soft splint material in here now? It, it's, it's probably next to models. It's the number one material printed. But the reality is, is I still get customers that say, well, it's yellow or it's this or it's that. And I would say, without any hesitation, nine times out of 10, their issues are gonna be in the, in the post-curing unit. People, I still go into laboratories and I find those file cabinets filled with fluorescent lights. And folks, please don't do that. You need to get a, a, a validated post-curing unit. Now on our website, we actually put all of the validation printer, all the validated printers in there, and we also give the settings, okay? So it's important that if you're having issues, it's a great resource. It's also a great resource for those of you who do not have a printer, is to go in there and look at, okay, which materials are validated on which printers. I mean, not all of them are validated on the carbon, and not all of them are validated on a sprint ray. So you wanna make sure that those, the ones, the applications that you wanna print are in that validation chart and that you see the entire workflow. So we're doing a whole presentation on this tomorrow because it really is an educational thing for us. We wanna make sure people are making the good decisions when it comes to choosing a printer and knowing the workflow. Was there a question back there? 
It, there's, um, it's, it's on our website, Keystone Industries, just to go forward slash validations and you'll see, you'll see it pop up. And it literally lists all the printers that we work with, all of the post carrying units that we work with, and it'll give you all of the settings that you need to use. And we've got a great deal on the auto class this weekend. Just have fun. Yep. Yeah. That's, the, a phenomenal that's the best one that's in the market right now. Yeah. Oh yeah, we've got plenty in stock right yep. now. So. And I will say, like when, when Keystone gives us our values back, particularly on mechanical properties, you'll see a fair amount of deviation, right? So it's within the accepted range, but some cure boxes kind of underperform. You're at the bottom end of that, and some are, are way up there. The auto flash is a phenomenal cure box. Yeah, I would say, I mean, especially anything that's gonna touch the patient, it has to be validated. It has to be validated, and you have to really respect that, because unlike any material we've been throwing at us, right, any material we've been exposed to, 3D printing, we're now part of the manufacturing process. We truly are. You know, compared to the days of a, you know, Emacs blue block, you know, that people were doing chair side. I'm not afraid of dentists doing stuff chair side at all. But a CAD block, even if they fired that wrong and milled it wrong, did everything wrong, the patient was still getting something that was safe, right? Like Ivoclar had full control over what the patient was really getting and getting in their mouth. So it really was just kind of the quality at that point. But now with resin printing, and with 3D printing in general, now we are part of the process. And we can have dramatic effects over a manufacturer who may give you a fantastic product and a fantastic printer. You can give the patient something that is completely horrible and unsafe still. So the validated workflow is paramount. I wish the companies would, would work harder and actually get in a clinician's office more to see what's going on there. Because right now the validated workflows work for technicians. We understand the processes and steps, but if you go into clinician's office, you know, oftentimes they have an assistant who's doing the process and they'll get a new assistant every month and they have to train them and a lot of times resin's sitting in the printer for a month without being printed, right? Or the bottle's not shaken up or not warm up. It, it's just, they need, you know, I think the manufacturers need to kind of open their eyes to how much they need to close that loop, right? How many printers out there are being sold without lids for the resin? Without validation. Without, but I mean, just without a lid, a storage lid, right? I mean, that's something that simple. That tells you how much they're actually not really grasping the idea of how simple they need to make it just for a clinician environment, so. What we've actually found out recently, too, is that some people, in order to get things, they say that everything is validated, but they, when they submit to the FDA, they use what they call predicates, which they're using our products as predicates, so they're not really testing everything through. They're just saying, well, this is a product that's comparable to Keystone Soft Splint, and so it should be fine, and then the FDA will sign off. So there's a lot of gray area there. So it's important, again, to make sure that the whole workflow is, you can't just take a sprint ray material and put it in a, in a carbon and expect it to work the way it's supposed to work. It's, it's gonna cause you problems down the road. So. We had a question in the front right here. Yeah. So we're, you know, this may be at the risk of sounding stupid, but you know, we're, we're sort of novices in this whole, you know, we started off with a form lab, now we have a sprint ray 55, and we're a perio prost office. So our form lab is doing all of our surgical guides and we're now delving into some other applications with the 55S. Mm -hmm. um, the validated workflows that you're referring to, are, are they for resins? In other words, like we, we've been playing around with different resins with our 55S for different applications. For example, Trusana, we find to be very good with implant applications and another resin is better with natural teeth. Are there validated, when you just clarity on the, that workflow, are those, those resins part of those validated workflows? Again, for, the, the for a specific printer. And you need to talk to the printer manufacturer, whoever you're getting the printer from. Like I can't take my material and put it in a Form Labs. Form Labs makes right. an unbelievable well, a surgical right. guide. No, but, but, but I but, think like with Trusana, like Myerson should be able to say, Yes, you well, know, we've tested the material, we've tested the, the printer, we've tested the wash station, and we tested the curing unit with this material. Those are the, the okay. steps that you want to so, make sure so that they've Myers, gone through. So we should, we should go to us for our... Yeah, they have on their website how... This is a great question, by the way. How to cure and how to wash. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. We've, yeah. And I will say, like, so IPA as a solvent, most re printed resins are pretty porous. 
you, the, the amount of time it says to leave in bath A, bath B is extremely important because um, you can really start, what'll happen is the IPA gets trapped and you put it in the cure box, cure box heats up and then that IPA is trapped within the part itself and you get like these micro eruptions that'll greatly degrade the, the strength of the overall finished part. So down to how long it's in the bath, um, you know, and then the other, well, the only other pet peeve I have, I gotta make a couple, but it's like, don't take your dirty bath, put it in the sunlight and say, I've skimmed all this stuff out. Like there's still a lot of invisibles floating around in that, in that IPA. That final pure IPA wash is really key to proper performance of the, of the device. One of the questions I ask is how long do you leave it in that bath? Yeah. I've had yeah. people tell me, well, I just left it in there overnight. You can't leave it in there overnight. Well, we try to follow the protocols, but it's trying to find the, the, the validation. Yeah. And then actually in our, where we are, is to actually, um, th this was very helpful actually, yeah. because, you know, we had a, we had a case with a, a Trusan on a tie base. It fit absolutely perfect, went in the mouth. I mean, zero adjustments. And he probably, not, I'm not sure, you know. It then cut down and bridge. Yeah, it did, did not. Yeah. So there has to be something you know, the tie base wouldn't fit in it when we used another. We're playing around with different resins, so uh -huh. there has to be something. Again, if the validation, validation as long as you're following the IIFU yeah. and everything has been validated, um, then you have reason to go back to the printer company and the material company and say, <laughs> Where, what am I doing wrong? I followed the IIFU just as yeah. you requested. So. Yeah, and I, I, I found also, I mean, IPA is, I think that's kind of, you know, an old dog that we're kind of stuck with a little bit. IPA is fantastic for models. I can't find anything better. Just the isopropyl alcohol. And I, and I, and I use a 99%, but I'm doing mostly models, right? And coarse models. And it's, it's, I'm hard, having a hard time finding a supplement for that. But now I'm hearing a lot of, at least on the clinical side, using glycerin. Yeah, Have so you heard of any? Well, yeah, so I mean, that's the thing I was saying is. It's a wash. For, for anything that I would say would be a class two or chair side. I would kind of stay away from the alcohol just because it, it, there's that fine line where you just go too far. And there's, it's just, it, it's just a very intolerable. So there are some products out there like HP Dent has their Innova Wash. Yeah. yeah. Has the Innova Wash. And, you know, a product like that, I swear, I've talked to Henning, the guy who made it. And I'm like, this is just goo gone, isn't it? You know, the bug and tar. I'm like, I know this is goo gone. Just tell me, right? Salter and Nowak as well. To yeah. yeah. <laughs> but it, it's, a, like it's, a, <laughs> yeah, it's a great, it's a great product uh, because it has a hard time really devastating the material. Like and that's a, a little more fun. And that's a water-based solvent. Yeah. So like at Origin, we would tend to use that for our primary wash. And then we'd use IPA on the final, but it's kind of just be consistent. But I, I would strongly suggest if for your clinic, I would have an ultrasonic using ultrasonic, the little stir bass. I mean, that's just spitting on your stuff. That's not doing anything. An ultrasonic will actually get up in a cavity, you know, and actually get the material out that's not cured. Um, otherwise, you may have had some products where you've taken out the stir and it looks clean, but maybe you hit it with an air hose and there was just a bunch of resin inside, right? And you had to go back in. So an ultrasonic, you don't have that issue. So it kind of takes that worry away, or if you have someone helping you, then you don't have to kind of teach them to kind of monitor that carefully. It's like, look, if we have this we have this cleaner that is a little safer, gives us a little fudge room if you leave it in there a minute or two too long, and we have an ultrasonic, which makes sure it actually gets clean. So you don't have to sit there with a brush and hand clean everything, which is what you're seeing with some of the ceramic resins coming out. They're very viscous and they're kind of a pain. The higher performance materials tend to go to the viscous side just because of what that gives you on the chemistry side. And so, you know, then you'll see like the Ferguson heater bath right to try to lower the viscosity and get a you don't you can quicken the print time just because you're not waiting as long for the material to fall back flow back up underneath plus you don't have as much force particularly on those first couple layers when you're lifting off because um, you've you're basically against the build plate so you've got a lot of force pulling against that membrane uh, as you're doing your burn in you know first 10 layers or so i i have to use alcohol for what i do but I, I, really am I really am reaching for a separate solution, right? I, I do not like the idea of having, because I have a, a 30 liter ultrasonic, and I do not like the idea of that essentially is a bomb waiting to go off, right? And so having you know, something flammable like IPA in your clinic, I would, if you don't have to have it, I would get rid of it. Hello. 
one trade-off you're going to find though is because I believe the harvest is the aqueous based is it has a much slower dry time so you might have to let it sit for 20 plus minutes to evaporate off where IPA has a high flash point and so it evaporates so if you're in a more production environment where you don't want to have that wait time then the IPA is yeah. is kind of preferred yeah I don't think there's a I don't think there's a fixed solution to that problem, right? That's part of the gap I'm saying needs to be closed on the clinic side, and especially with these new materials. Like, I think IPA is falling short. So yeah, the, use a harvest type material, some type of, you know, kind of your degreaser type base, which is essentially what that is. Um, you know, and even if you do need it to dry off quicker, you can have a little bit of alcohol in a spray bottle or irrigation bottle, and you can just rinse it off over the sink and that'll get it to dry very fast. You know, but it's not going to have devastating effects on your material. We're trying to come out with a new something to replace with IPA right now. So it's it is a problem, especially for big users when you got to have five gallon pails of this stuff laying around. It's it's a hazard. Do you have a question? I have a question on cure boxes. So how do you know that it's curing the product fully? Like, is there a way to testing? It it's we test them all. So what if you. Well, you'd probably have to go back to the manufacturer on that one just to have them, if there's a way they can test the, or calibrate the original to the original um, settings that are I mean, on there. Otherwise, I mean, you can buy a light meter, but you have to know what the original yeah. readings would have been or should have been. Um, I know Thor Labs makes one. I think it's about 500 bucks. Um, so radiometer would be the other name you'll see for it. I mean, that's that's what we would use at uh, at the printer level just on the intensity of what's projecting. So, you know, like at Origin, we'd set ours to like five nanometers. At Sega, we were like at seven. Some people will run them real high, like in the 20s. So it, but the cure box, you, you just make sure like what you have, it's, if it's broad spectrum, it needs to be something that is either at your peak. So like a 405, 385, which is where you're gonna get the majority of your cure. The reason people, auto flash works so well is it's a broad spectrum. So it's actually outputting light across the entire spectrum uh, of known light, right? So you get a much better cure um, because you're hitting the light spectrum for each kind of component within that chemistry. When you're LED only, you're outputting just that one wavelength in a pretty narrow band. So you can get some high intensity, but you're not gonna get as much like daylight, right? All the different light spectrum hitting the part. <laughs> I mean, you're you're fairly you're fairly safe. What I what I worry about, which I think will be an issue, is in the clinic environment when we'll have validated cure boxes, and you'll have companies say, "Yeah, you can cure this part in two seconds," similar to like a cure light, right? And I know that we've done studies like that with Ultradent, where we validated you know the curing wands, and it, it is it's kind of scary to see how much they vary from the, what the company claims, and that is just simple through a light meter, right? Uh, so you could get a light meter and, and uh, look at that, essentially. Do you think that's necessary, though? Or not, really? not, not so much. I don't think that's necessary yet because we're kind of working with a big, uh, we're working with kind of a lot of, you know, fudge room top and bottom with our processes right now. But I think as we get more to a clinic environment where it's going to be, you know, time sensitive, that's where it's going to be very touch and go. But Sean would gladly put you on a six-month new bulb replacement schedule. <laughs> <laughs> Just don't buy a, a a fingernail one. I've yeah, seen a lot of those out there yes. too. Well, so. from my Envision tech that I bought 15 years ago. That, that auto flash, like I think we'd all probably agree that that's probably the best made um, one out there. I wish everybody had that one. Uvitron makes another one. They're a company out of Boston that makes a good one too. They're not in dentistry, but they make a good quality commercial machine as well. Maybe that's a great product idea for Keystone is a, a resin, you know, a little resin chip, or if it's this color, that's what you got. If it's that color, that's what you got. We've actually thought about coming out with a, with a curing unit because it's a question that comes up so much, especially um, on these the lower end of the printers out there. Um, we, we just we have a lot of concern about the direction that's going in. We know that inevitably there's going to be more and more printers in that space, but the the post curing is. I mean, I read on Dr. Ferguson. I'm sure a lot of you guys have seen that. These people that say somebody said it before about you know, oh, do I have to post cure it? Um, you don't have to, but if you like spending time in court, that's maybe a good way to go. So. <laughs>
All right, I think we are just about right on time. So look, I appreciate uh, my panel. I appreciate everybody coming in here. Hopefully you all got some, uh, some information. Uh, so uh, thank you guys for, uh, for stopping in.